All right, guys, we, I think we're going to start. Um, good afternoon to everybody. I hope you had a, a good, productive day, start to the week. Um, the last week, can you imagine the last week of July already? Um, so for those of you who don't know much about us, we're, uh, we basically do two things. It's a business we started 30 years ago. We basically do two things today. As I said, the first one is we publish books like we've, we're launching here today. We're a, we're a niche boutique publisher, publish about 15 to 20 titles per annum. And, um, mainly in the field of uh, management, the tough stuff, that what I always call the tough stuff, leadership, uh, management, mm -hmm. human resources, talent management, and those sort of areas. At the same time, we also have a conferencing division and we publish, um, we, we run, the conferences and workshops are mainly in the same sort of genre that I've just mentioned in terms of publishing. Um, so we're very excited to launch our two latest books this afternoon. Um, and uh, we have a wide audience amongst others, apart from South Africa, we have people from Greece, uh, the USA, Namibia, UK, and Botswana, Portugal, Canada as well. Um, so welcome to all of you. Um, thanks for joining us. And we, we really appreciate you taking the time and effort to support our authors this afternoon. So this is how we're going to handle it. I'm going to introduce um, Sunny first to you and uh, Michael, and that is the book about everything you ever wanted to know about managing people, but were afraid to ask. So I'm going to int introduce them and they're going to take about 15 minutes to, to tell you more about the book, how the book came about, uh, the highlights of it. And then we move on to Paul, and we hope we can still sort out this technical glitch on that side with Paul as well. Um, and then, then we move on with uh, questions and discussions and so on. Um, I see on the screen there's just another book that we're going to bring out um, in the uh, middle of August, and that's the launch of uh, Dave van der Your Leadership Footprint. So you're welcome to, to attend that launch as well. Right. Uh, let me introduce to you Sunny and, and Michael. Sunny, I know for, for many years, she's been a prolific uh, author of many books on coaching and leadership. Uh, probably the uh, doyen when it comes to, to coaching in South Africa. So one or two things about her. Um, I'm definitely not going to go through the whole CV of, of either Sunny or uh, Michael or Paul for that matter. So Sunny is Director of People Quotient, uh, PTY Limited. She's amongst others, a doctoral supervisor at several business schools. She's a member of the Management Coaching Faculty of the School of Business at the University of Stellenbosch. She's part-time faculty at the South African College for, of Applied Psychology and on the Global Faculty for Time to Think, Inc. She is founding fellow at the Institute of Coaching at McLean Hospital which is a Harvard Medical School affiliate. And then on top of it, she plows back a tremendous lot of um, time, effort, energy, wisdom into the coaching profession as well. And for that, she's the founding president of uh, Comensa, which is, stands for Coaching and Mentors of South Africa. And she has authored six books, of whom we published quite a number of them. And then Michael uh, uh, Taylor is an experienced facilitator, international management consultant, and master coach. Um, he has deep exp expertise in understanding, implementing culture change, building world-class teams, and developing global leaders. He experienced firsthand the excitement of running profitable, high-engagement businesses, which included managing a team of 25 professional consult consultants, amongst others. Um, he is the managing director of Exponential Limited, uh, is a prof which is a professional services firm we started in 2006 and director of people quotient. Uh, he's a qualified organizational behaviorist and master, master coach. And he completed his MPhil in coaching at also at uh, Stellenbosch uh, Business School. So to, to you two specifically, uh, Sunny and uh, Michael, welcome. And uh, Sunny, tell us a bit more about the book. Why um, a book... 
at this stage about managing and the role of um, and, and the management leadership role that that our people are playing. Can you maybe elaborate a bit? Sure. And in fact, Mike and I, if it's okay, we'll elaborate together because we tend to do yes. a kind of a, a, a double act, if that's all right. So today we really just want to briefly tell you about why we wrote this book and what the core themes are and what's in it for you and really about why it's important to have this book close to you as a reference guide, whether you are a manager, a leader, or a coach or mentor who works with leaders and managers. And one of the reasons that, um, that Mike and I, with our contributing editor, Ingra dubuisson narsai and she couldn't be here today. She's a clinical psychologist and neuroscientist, and she's written the really wonderful chapter with us on the brain and stress. Um, but we wrote it because we found that so many leaders and managers that we work with really struggle to acquire the skills and the competences that they need to effectively understand and manage their people, let alone their businesses. And we really wanted a book we could hand to our leader managers to say, this is where you can find out about delegation, motivation, managing conflict, whatever it is, because often they're not trained and they are um, usually promoted according to their technical skill. Mike? Yeah, thanks, Sunny. And I think managers often think of themselves as leaders, but they don't really know the difference between management and leadership. And we wanted to provide a field guide for those leaders and managers who need answers to the following questions. And these are some of the questions I had early in my career. And one of them might be, what skills do I need to excel in my leadership role? And when I get promoted, how do I know what to do in this next level role? When do I lead? When do I manage? And what's the difference? Does it even matter? And then the other questions might be, will a professional business school qualification help me develop into a professional manager? Uh, some people might ask, why am I constantly overlooked for promotion? And it's starting to feel personal. Other people might say, my manager seems to lack the language and the social intelligence to engage in a mature conversation about my development. And very often people tell us my development plan is actually vague and there's very little support for my own career progression. Sunny? So why is this book important? So there are a couple of reasons. Uh, today, uh, the consequence of our very complex and uncertain business environments um, everybody talks about VUCA, um, is that leadership skills are subject to continual obsolescence and displacement. Things come and go. And what worked in the 80s and 90s doesn't work today. What worked in the 90s and the uh, 2000s doesn't work today. And man managers just aren't being provided with the skill sets that they need for leadership in, an, in a business environment that's moving, changing, adapting really rapidly, rapidly, and not just as a consequence of the pandemic, although that had a major impact. So we wanted to write a field guide for those leaders and managers that wanted to take a trip down the, down, the, down the path of finding out about who they are as a leader, who they are as a manager, what do they do well, what don't they do well, how could they assess themselves, how can they enhance their skills, how could they enhance their own cultural, emotional, and people intelligences, how could they develop the, cap the capacity to inspire and motivate and develop their people, and really critically is how can they understand the underlying factors of stress and the impact of stress on the brain, on the body, and on health, which really hits you hard if you cannot work as a leader and hits your team hard if they can't. And we saw that with the pandemic. They need to learn how to delegate, to motivate, to inspire hope in people. They need to manage conflict, difficult situations, difficult people. And a core skill and competence is that of communication skills to the fullest range from communicating verbally and dealing with conflict, managing people, winning over people, winning over clients and customers. So we also see many business leaders are actually emotionally disconnected from the employees that they lead. One in three employees, and this is really striking, don't trust their employer despite the fact that billions are spent every year on developing 
the skills of those leaders. Right. And one thing that's interesting with all the online employee engagement uh, assessments that we've had, there's recently been a, a flurry of apps that have come out that employees complete daily, but very often it's kind of like it's, you, you complete it daily on how you're experiencing your manager, but people have, are almost too afraid to be honest with that feedback as the manager, a manager catches them up saying, you scored me a two out of five, what's going on? And they castigate them for any negative feedback. And so it's, it's no wonder that, you know, that statistic around 75% of people, and mostly your outstanding ones, quit their job to get away from their manager at some point in their career. So when one looks at workplace integration of training, which is really critical to, to execute uh, the, the learning, is business schools are booming. They're turning out graduate professionals by the thousands. But organizations don't seem to appear to have countered that parallel universe syndrome in which managers attend these excellent courses that promotes these great mindsets. But they go back to the workplace and they get stuck in the culture of old routines and a manager says, don't bring those new things into our workplace environment. Sunny? So, thanks. We work with what we call being a leader manager um, because you can't lead without managing and you can't manage without leading. So the most important competence for you as a leader manager is that of self-awareness, of conscious observation of yourself and others, but a thorough, having a thorough understanding of yourself. It's critically important that you understand and know how your teams experience you. So you need to be able to reflect. You need to be able to help your people reflect. This is the path towards identifying what change is needed in terms of your own behavior and your assumptions that you make that might not necessarily be true about yourself and others. And it's really vital to have a clear understanding of how you think how you feel, how you behave, and how are people experiencing you? What could you keep and what do you really need to change? And we work with leaders where they don't actually know the impact, positive and negative, that they have on people until they start to understand um, the way they are thinking and how that behavior shows up in, in, with, with their people. Definitions of leadership are continuing to emerge globally. You know, we have thousands of definitions of leadership. We look at it that great leadership works through the emotions, whether it's creating strategy or it's mobilizing your team to action. The leader acts as the group's emotional guide. Leaders don't tend to think about that. They don't tend to think they need to know something about people um, um, besides who and how they are at work. And exceptional leaders embrace people recognize their talents, desire to see others succeed, and they create a psychologically safe environment for people to share their thoughts and to engage fully. But they need to know how to create a psychologically safe environment. Now, the classic definition of a manager, all of you will probably know, is achieving results through other people. So a manager is a person responsible for supervising and motivating employees and for directing the progress of an organization. But on the other hand, if you cannot manage yourself, you're not going to be able to manage people. So the first step in leading and managing means increasing your own emotional intelligence, which is really about four critical um, functions. One is self-awareness, the first emotional intelligence competence. It's about knowing yourself, understanding your own resistance to situations. And Mike and I are always talking about uh, what, what do we resist? being told what to do or whatever it might be. Having a deep understanding of your purpose is critically important. What's your purpose in life? What's your purpose as a leader, as a manager? What's your purpose as a coach? And how aware of you of your own blind spots in terms of how you think, how you feel and how you behave. Those are the, really the three corner areas. And then self-management is the second competence emotionally. It's how you engage with others. It's your interpersonal behavior. It's your communication and your management skills. So think about it. How are people experiencing you as you engage with them? How do you come across? Very often you come across quite the opposite of the way you think. Relationship awareness is the third competence, and that's really about understanding your culture in your business, in your educational institution, in whatever institution or, 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 or 
organization or environment that you work in? What are the values and the beliefs and the feelings in the working environment? What are the politics within your organization? And this is key. What are the unspokens in your working environment? What, what do we not talk about? What are the elephants in the room that we don't talk about? And how can you ensure a more transparent and a collaborative culture? We try to cover all of these areas. And the fourth emotional competence is relationship management. And this is about team behavior and how teams behave with teams. It's about people management, about conflict management, the integration of the systems within the organization or those linking you to the wider community. So what is your responsibility in ensuring that different divisions and stakeholders actually can positively engage with each other and manage tensions as they emerge? I think I one thing, uh, thanks anyone. One, one thing people will be quite excited with in the book is the, the, the prominent emergence of this con context of leadership agility. And in 2011, I think it was 2011, I went over to Boston to study with Bill Joyner, who's an American academic and a researcher. And he predicted that this concept of leadership agility would become the master competency needed for success in, in, a, in a turbulent economy. And, I, and that's, you know, 2011. So I guess he's been pretty prophetic with that. What is leadership agility? It's the ability of a leader to sense and respond to changes in their environment with very focused, fast and flexible actions. It's not sitting around waiting for things to happen. And it's about a leader's ability to prepare their employees for, for a volatile and a very uncertain world. And that requires a lot of mental and emotional resilience with every person tasked for the responsibility of leadership, as well as the coaches who need to coach these leaders. So what is striking in the research uh, conducted by Bill was over 600 managers he studied over a four-year period. And they report, he reported that less than 10% of the managers he looked at globally have mastered the level of emotional maturity and agility needed to deal with today's disruptive business world. So to be effective, leaders must demonstrate this flexibility and as well as the willingness and the capability to learn from experiences and apply that learning into their new workplace environments. Sanin? So it's really, it's wonderful. I'm seeing all the comments through coming on the chat and we'll pick up on some of those things because we're, uh, there was a comment about values-based leadership, something about age um, being an issue in South Africa. And actually it's not just in South Africa, it's all over the world where an older manager doesn't wanna be managed by a younger manager. Um, and there are other issues that come up, gender-based issues, as well as experience issues. So as senior leaders, our primary responsibility is to create hope in times of uncertainty and fear. And that's definitely what we've gone through with the pandemic, and we're not through it yet. And we've learned a lot, and maybe we haven't learned it quite yet. So the way to do this is through articulating and inspiring and a positive vision of the future with your people helping them to interpret this vision in their functional teams. If really ensuring effective and if you like uh, efficient execution against whatever your perform performance criteria are. But the key thing is how are you involving people? Because it can't just be your vision. It has to be a vision with them and that they take a part in, even if it's only to, to, talk, to help you figure out how to put your vision in place. So the major aim of this book is really to help you as a leader, develop, uh, leader manager to develop greater self-awareness of your own needs and your growth requirements, hoping that that will help you become more conscious of how people experience you as a leader manager and starting to observe what they need, because that's critically important, how you grow and develop them and their careers. Leader managers need agility as Mike said, the ability to learn, the ways and the means to manage conflict. Mike and I coach our leaders into managing conflict. Sometimes they can't do it themselves to begin with, but in the end they do it because it's critically important they know how. And many leader managers run away from tension and conflict. At the same time, leader managers need to develop resilience, emotional intelligence, I've seen a lot of that on the chat, empathy among their direct reports and team members, but the, the most important skill 
is learning fast, going deep with your people, helping them discover who they are and how they can achieve their potential. But you can't help them unless you help yourself first. Great. So, so this is our, thanks, Anita. This is our first book in, in this Management Mastery and Practice series. And it's kind of been an introduction to the, the core principles of managing people and teams. And beyond that, it aims to provide some very practical steps to kind of foster an understanding that we can't manage others without identifying our own motivations, without understanding the limiting assumptions that often hinder us, and then also our overt behaviors that often trip us up. So the next book in the series is very stimulating and a thoughtful contribution by our colleague um, Dumisani Magadlela, and he's called that uh, Ubuntu Coaching and Con Connection Practices for Leader Managers. And that'll be published towards the end of this year. Sunny? So there's just been a comment about, do we consider this in terms of the new hybrid working environment? Absolutely. And it's something Sunny, we touch can, on. Sorry, can I, can I quickly interrupt you? Uh, just quickly, yeah. um, the, the, the discussion we can have after the two presentations. That's about fine. The, I'm just, I have right. two, two more things to say, if okay. that's okay. Yeah, no, no, we're not going to get into discussion. I'm just letting people Good. know we're seeing their, their comments. Yeah. So one of the, the, the key things is working out how do we lead and manage in, 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 a, in a new way of working, which is the hybrid model. So we're hoping that we're going to introduce you to some of the essential principles of managing people, but that it's going to really give you an essential map to managing yourself, which is a lifelong process, which if you follow it effectively, it can lead to enriching your learning and your, profici and your proficiency in all areas of your life. Mike, do you want to just say Yeah, I think, I think we, yeah, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to, to say that there's seldom been a more important time in this country's history where we need courageous ethical leadership. And the daily cry we hear is for leaders to stand up, make yourself heard, and for individuals who are clear on their personal values, who are prepared to learn fast, but who can reset even stronger after failure and disappointment. So last thing, most of all, we think and we feel that we need individuals who can do the hard yards of management, not just be promoted for their technical skill, making things happen with clarity of mind, confidence, decisiveness, developing new skill and competence, developing their people, while also being adept at providing positivity with hope and inspiration in the most difficult of times. Mike? Yeah, so I think the... I think we're gonna open, open the floor the for floor. questions later. Yeah. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, um, yeah I think, uh, thank you for that. It's clear that there's a tremendous richness in the book, which is being um, enhanced with a lot of checklists, practical applications, case studies, and, 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 and um, examples that people can, can um, sort of allude to. So thank you. We're going to come back because there's, there's a, a, a quite a warm discussion at the moment going on already around um, what you have uh, said and around the book. But I'm going to move on to our next um, uh, next uh, book and the two authors, which um, with Paul and uh, Tanya. So uh, welcome to both of you. Um, I Thanks, hope that uh, Paul, can you hear me now, Paul? Yes, can you hear you? Beautiful. Right, so fantastic. <clears throat> the next book is called uh, Character Insights for a Regenerative uh, Future. Five Leadership Superpowers to Drive Growth, Innovation, and the Future of Work. So um, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the two of them. Uh, Paul holds uh, an executive MBA from in the business school. He's an alumni of uh, Singularity University of South Africa and the Think School of Creative Leadership in the Netherlands. Um, he also studied uh, prior to that at uh, Rhodes University. Uh, Paul is a corporate innovation advisor uh, entrepreneur and inventor. <clears throat> and in uh, 2016, he founded the Strategic Innovation Studio to help the best corporate leaders and their teams solve differently. Um, his studio uh, is also home to Can Do, a cohesive 
and sustainable empowerment model for employee-driven innovation, as well as campfire and networking storytelling platform for South Africa's top innovation leaders. Um, but just one or two things, he was also prior to that, um, <clears throat> head of innovation at uh, two major banks in South Africa. So welcome, Paul, to you. And then Tanya, who, um, who worked with him on the book, uh, she's an author, columnist, and journalist with a special interest in relations, uh, psychology, uh, transformational leadership, and health. Her work has appeared across a wide range of media, including Mail and Guardian, the JSE, African Decisions, Mary Claire, uh, Cosmopolitan24.com, um, just to mention a few. And then she's also, she's published um, books around, uh, 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 on, on fiction, and the latest one is Fulcrum. And I, I suggest, Tanya, um, add your, uh, or, or post your uh, website oh, on the chat room so people can access and get more information about that book. All right. Sure. Thanks. Okay, over to you, Paul. Um, tell us more about the book. Thanks, Wilhelm. It's great to be here, and thanks for the opportunity, and it was great. Um, to, to hear from Sonny and Michael and, and learn more about the journey that they've been on writing their book. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the backstory to the book is, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, one of the recipients of the winner of the Cosmic Lottery, I'm a, a white male who was raised in apartheid South Africa. And I think with that came a lot of opportunities to um, learn and grow in the work that I did. I've, I've been interested and in, involved in the innovation space for over a decade now. Um, and I was uh, wondering, I obviously made lots of mistakes during that time. Um, and so I was looking for an opportunity to pay it forward by sharing some of those school fees because some of them were quite large and expensive. Um, and so yeah, in the interest of, of being a, a worthy ancestor, I, I, I thought it would be useful to, to jot down some of those um, lessons learned. Um, and I was often invited to speak at companies about um, some of the experiences that I've, that I've had in, the, in this space. And we would find ourselves talking about um, the importance of innovation strategy and the emergence of some really exciting innovation philosophies and practices over the last 10 years, which um, many of which have their origins in the startup world and have made their way into more comp complex organizations. So we would speak about operating models as well. Um, but it was quite interesting that uh, many of those that hadn't fallen asleep during those presentations would suddenly start waking their peers up uh, uh, during the part in which I'd start talking about people and my experience of um, great innovators. And essentially my hypothesis was that, uh, you know, you can, you can often strangely have the, you know, the, the, the best resources available for innovation. You can have excellent um, executive management buy-in. You can have a really good idea. Um, but despite all of that, still have a terrible innovation outcome. And the antithesis is also true. You can often have a poor idea um, with very little support, uh, but a great bunch of people and have a fantastic innovation outcome. And, um, and that kind of deeply intrigued me and I, and I wondered why that might be the case. So um, the book really is ab about some insights that have developed over the last few years and our deeper hypothesis around the fact that um, in the world of psychology, there's now really compelling evidence to show the link between character strengths and achievement in the real world. And it's quite fascinating for me that um, as a species, we haven't actually studied character strengths. We've been obsessed with personality for many, many years. And we've used um, psychometric testing as a, as a lazy heuristic to make uh, decisions around how to promote people and give them access to opportunities. Um, the other thing, and, and, and often we know that with psychometric tests, for example, um, people can game the outcome. Um, and also when you put them under pressure, the psychometric profiles change. Uh, what I like about character strengths is that um, often when you put people under pressure, uh, their real character actually comes to the fore rather than, than, than changes. Um, so yeah, I became intrigued as to uh, you know, what it was, the DNA of leadership, and the fact that in more modern organizations, leadership isn't the function of the executive team. 
Um, it really, uh, I think Brene Brown is a wonderful quote that sounds something like, um, um, leaders are, are any people who can see the potential in other people and processes and have the courage to develop it. And I think in modern organizations that are, are less hierarchical, you find um, people demonstrating that kind of leadership at all levels of the organization. It's no longer the domain of, of the C-suite. So uh, yeah, there's a British TV series called Professor T. It's about a criminologist who studies uh, criminals and uh, helps the police catch them. And I guess in a way that's, uh, that's the big disclaimer on the book is I don't uh, regard myself as, as, as one of those leaders with uh, character, but um, I've really enjoyed studying them and with the help of Tanya distilling what is it that um, makes them special and how they come together to build trust and, and deliver absolutely sensational innovation outcomes that are, are, are really helping to create the kind of future that they want, which is a regenerative, re regenerative one. Right, Tanya. Yeah, I, um, you know, I was so interesting listening to Sunny and and Michael talk about the qualities that are needed in in leadership and in researching these five qualities. So for those who don't know, it's um, you know through Paul's work and through talking to him and kind of surfacing what he's found and tying that into research. The five kind of like main character strengths that we find really work for leaders in bringing change in their organizations and um, really good um, responses from their employees is um, intellectual humility, uh, grit, um, empathy, growth mindset, and uh, what's the last one? Uh, which one did we list? Let me check. Other centeredness, that's it, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, whenever I hear um, other researchers and leaders like Sonny and Paul talk about these leadership characters, it all kind, kind of funnels into those five main traits. Um, and what was so fantastic about kind of helping Paul put this book together was actually finding that research that's there, that's already been done. There's a whole, you know, a, a deep and um, very broad body of work that really goes to um, confirm that each of these traits um, are what make great leaders that, that where you see results in the organization, you know, the work with um, Kill, with Dweck, with, uh, with Ducksworth, you know, it's all there. Um, and it's just so great hearing it sort of come out in a lot of the literature that's, that's the business literature that's coming out now, that business leadership wants to go to a new place. Sunny mentioned earlier that the, you know, the work and the ways of working that, that worked in the 80s and the 90s no longer work for people. And that's just true. It just isn't working. Um, and part of that new ways of working has to involve um, new kinds of leadership and new kinds of people that will, as Paul always say, like leave a legacy that, you know, you can be proud of. Um, so yeah, that was, um, that was very sort of fundamental to me and very interesting and very interesting to see kind of come together in this in this book. Great. Um, you know what, um, Michael and uh, Sonny, can you guys join us again, please? Um, thank you. For I that, can't Tanya. start the video because um, you've, you've blocked the video, so I can't start that. No. Um, Tina, can you unblock that video, please? And, and mine as well, please, Tina. <laughs> there we are. And Michael, also. Thank you. I don't know why that is happening. Okay. I'll start up. Here we come. Okay. Okay. So interesting enough. That just for the for the for the um, let's call them the delegates, the guests. These were the two books that we battled the most to get uh, the right uh, titles for, by the way. For a long time, <laughs> on both sides, we went to and fro and said, what is now really? And actually, they uh, complement each other quite, quite nicely. Here's something else that I've read uh, recently in our business reviews. A study that they've done um, over a 15-year period with 5,000, analyzing 5,000 job descriptions and role descriptions in um, 
for 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 the C-suite. So basically, five five uh, 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 CEOs, uh, chief information officers, marketing director, CFOs, chief mm. HR officers, and what they found was that this jobs that were uh, advertised, by the way. So um, what they found was that the number of times that they referred to the technical skills, like accounting or financial skills rather, um, um, IT skills and so on and so on, that dropped by 30%. Hmm. And the number of soft skills that were listed increased by 40% over a 10 year period. And by the way, Sunny, you mentioned here, communication skills, how important that is. That's apparently now the most important skill that they've uh, identified for, or one of the most important parts. Um, right, I think guys, we have a tremendous um, number of queries and comments and so on. Um, let me see quickly here. Um, you, you touched on the age story already, um, Sunny. Um, People can't wait to acquire the book. Please, guys, go on the website and buy the book. Um, it is there, 15% discount. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've received great feedback on the books already, and we've received uh, quite a number of orders already. We're quite excited about that. Um, I just want to see here. Well, okay. Uh, Paul, now, this is quite interesting. Um, so... so John is asking, he says, great insight. Sports such as golf is a great measure of the man or the woman. Ah. Uh, any practical ideas on testing character and then on how to actually build character in the real world? You want to give it a go? And anybody is, yeah. of the other three is, uh, is welcome to join Paul in, in talk there. But all right, Paul, give it a go. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question and a million dollar question. We do cover a bit of that in the book. We try and give some um, heads up. Uh, Tanya's done some great research on the experts on each of the character strengths that are reflected in the book and um, how to level up, essentially. So um, the answers are different depending on the, on the character strength. Uh, but interesting that you mentioned golf because arguably, yes, absolutely, a sport that would test anyone's uh, mental abilities and, and, and character strengths. But often in the innovation world, um, there's this um, slightly corny but very sticky phrase that there's no I in innovation. And um, it really takes a lot of collaboration to, to um, deliver great change. So um, character strengths, in my experience, are built in the real world, um, they're built experimentally, um, they're built through others. So if we think about something um, like deepening empathy, the only way to deepen empathy is through engaging other people um, and listening carefully and observing carefully and trying to surface, um, you know, the, 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 their deepest pains and, um, and, and, and what really uh, excites them uh, and triggers them emotively. So, you know, deepening empathy is a very difficult thing to, to do on your own. Similarly, intellectual humility. Uh, for me, it's kind of like upgrading the software on your computer when you get a big upgrade for your operating system. Um, and often you're relying on other people to provide that, that upgrade. Uh, growth mindset is, is maybe uh, just laboring on the technology metaphor. It's kind of like downloading new apps. Um, and again, you, you need to be willing to be open to what other people have to teach and unlearn what you already know. So um, arguably for me and in the context of the book that we've written, um, character strengths are, are very much developed uh, through synergy and relationships uh, with others. Um, quite difficult, I think, to, to just develop on your own. What was interesting about it, of course, was that was finding out how many of the researchers that actually emphasized over and over again was that any character strength is one that can be built. You know, if you're a leader and you feel that you kind of suffer on the growth mindset side or you're low on the kind of intellectual humility, it's not like that's not a character strength that has to stay that way forever. You can literally build that as you might build a muscle. And a lot of it is through having the intellectual humility to find mentors, as Paul was saying, find mentors, be open to, um, to learning. 
But I suppose the paradox in that is, is that you need to have the intellectual humility to know that you need to learn, you know. So um, I think anybody reading these kinds of books, however, is automatically open to learning. So you're kind of already ahead of the game there. Mm. Uh, Sunny and, and Mike, maybe, and uh, obviously uh, Paul and Tanya can also comment on this. I was reading this afternoon. Um, the uh, it's it's the latest global talent uh, uh, competitive index, and they analyze. It's done by INSEAD, and 128 sort of uh, countries that they they, they uh, rank. We are dropping every year. We're I think we're now 86, 68. Sorry. Um, but one of the things that really surprised me about the top, uh, one of the, the criteria was now professional management. And we were ranked 70th in the world. And I, I thought that uh, we would have been much more up there. And, um, and, and, and it's not, it came out as a, quite of a shock to me. Do you want to comment on that? Do you think there's so much room Mike, for improvement? Mike, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Um, yeah, I think you can go on this one and then I'll... <laughs> okay, so, well, a couple of comments. First of all, I want to say congratulations to Paul and Tanya. Well done. I'm really looking forward to reading your book. And I really love what you said about characteristics being built through relationships and experience, because that's absolutely right. In terms of where South Africa is, we have some really good examples of why there is a problem. So um, one of the key things is being willing to learn and being willing to change and being willing to change your behavior if it's needed and Billy, being willing to learn from your people and have them be better than you, than you are at, at, at what you're doing. That's really critically important and really difficult for leaders to do. An example is one leader we worked with we always um, do a coaching interview with all the members of an exco or a board or the team or whatever before we do a team coaching with the leader and his or her team. And one of the things that was very clear was if this particular leader did not change their behavior, that they were going to lose all their people. They, this person would not have stayed in their position as CEO much longer than about six months. And at first was not willing to change. However, upon receiving feedback that was very positively phrased in terms of all the difficulties, but with some real um, requests from people about what needed to change because it was a punishment culture, a command and control and punishment culture, which doesn't work anymore and is very prevalent in South Africa. This leader in the first day was very quiet, and very subdued, very, very unsure of what, what he would do with the feedback. And in the evening, he had um, an insight, which was that he his team needed him and that he needed his team and that if he didn't engage with them, he, if he didn't get to know them, if he didn't build trust, if he didn't let them be smart where they were smart, that it wasn't gonna work. And so he, it's really, really difficult for him to change 30 years of command and control punishment management style, but he's working on it. So it's about learning agility, humility, understanding yourself and being able to change. And if we can do that in South Africa, we need to let go of a lot of things. And politics is the other aspect in business that needs to be managed very carefully. Mike, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think I've got one, one answer to Willem's question is, uh... Lalim is ESCOM 2.0 is our definition of competition. Okay. We have a social okay. mindset that doesn't understand. Yeah, I think that um, answers that. All right. But guys, I hope you, the four of you are checking the, the, the chat room there because, and, yeah. and even the questions. I mean, the appreciation that people are showing to all four of you for the roles that you've played in their lives and for... Um, for con making this contribution in terms of the two books and how they enjoy reading your books already is, is uh, it's astounding. Uh, Paul, I think there's a nice question here from uh, Craig who says, um, were there character traits that seemed interesting but did not make the top five for some reason? And uh, what did you reject for the list and why? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I probably need to check my notes. I think we, we, we try to 
we created this bucket called other centeredness and we <laughs> cram everything under that I mean, there are things that are difficult to talk about in the workplace, things like kindness. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we, talk, we talk about Ubuntu, which is about interconnectedness, but it's also about helping each other and, um, you know, recognizing that we, 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 we're all connected and we can only um, really survive as a result of those connections. It's almost a very Buddhist precept, but very hard to bring into the, um, to the, to the workplace kind of lexicon. So... Uh, it's great to see things like purpose. Purpose is well covered in a lot of other books. Um, and so we do touch on it under grit because we link it to passion and perseverance. Um, and so it's somewhat linked under Angela Duckworth's uh, equation around uh, you know, what constitutes grit. Um, yeah, but I, th I think that, uh, Tanya, where the others, uh, gratitude is another one that... Um, yeah. I, I, my wife always reminds me I need to work on it. We all have lots to be grateful for. If, you, if you're in a workplace, the fact that you've got a job, um, someone's given you an opportunity and is recognizing your level of skill and expertise and, um, and you're part of some kind of collective that can weather storms and create value in the world. So I think uh, gratitude is, 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 is one that we, maybe it was difficult to, Put that under other centeredness. No, so it's yeah. in no, it's in other centeredness. They're all like really big kind of buckets. So for example, you know, yeah. growth mindset has creativity, it's got uh it's got curiosity, it's got so they're quite broad umbrella, umbrella looks at character, and then we drill down a little bit into those. So we try to cram as much in as possible into those yeah, five. Yeah. We, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> we, we used all the others as uh one of the other big four as Trojan horses to sneak in uh, <laughs> yeah. some of our yeah. secret favorites, yeah. which are all yeah. the other centeredness. But that's a, that's a great question. Um, for those who are interested in a good list of character strengths, there's a wonderful reference site, and I'll post it in the link uh, in the chat, uh, called Character Lab, and they have a series of playbooks uh, under three dimensions, strengths of um, head, heart, and mind. Mm -hmm. and, um, and although their target market is teachers working with children, um, uh, they are a very research-driven organization, so it's all based in really solid um, social science. And, uh, and, and the playbook's actually, back to John's question, yeah, they've, got yeah, some yeah. Good, they've really got some good insights in how to level up and, uh, you know, each of those buckets. And I think, uh, Tanya, maybe there are about 11 or more characters yeah, okay. listed on the, on the, in total. So characterlab.org um, uh, and, and check out their playbooks. It's a great resource, yeah. especially if you're a parent uh, or a grandparent or, a, uh, you know, you have children in your life and you care about them. Um, that's, a, that's a great little uh, place to go and visit for some inspiration on, on, on how to help them develop some character strengths. Yeah. Uh, Paul, just quickly, that's the Angela Duckworth uh, work that, that's... Um, yeah, she's, she's the CEO of uh, Character Lab. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, it, it, for the for the listeners' uh, sake, introduce that website to as many teachers as you can. It is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Okay, now, guys, uh, let's get a bit more personal. Um, <laughs> we've come through. Uh, what is it now? Twenty month, twenty nine months of. Uh, uh, of, mm -hmm. Since COVID started, since we, we moved into the lockdown, it's been tough. It's had its impact on uh, our personal lives, on the businesses, and so on and so on. Tell us what I, I want to know from you now. Um, what kept you going? Uh, what uh, brought you hope? Um, and then the last thing is, uh, this is a tough country that we're in. I mean, uh, we, we're blessed. We, we thank God for electricity every time the the switch goes on, you know. Um, so, so, how do you cope in in uh, adverse and adverse circumstances and environments as well? And I'm going to start with Mike, and then move on to Sunny, and then Tanya, and then Paul. And what message of hope do you have, Mike? No, it's a fascinating question, and I think the when lockdown hit in 25th of March 2020. Uh, the next day, we had to reimagine a new business because people were not allowed to be in rooms. Um, I didn't know what Zoom was. I'd never really used a social media platform like it before. 
And my business depended on that ability to learn something immediately. Uh, or you die. It's a, it's a, it was a do or die situation. So it, it kind of, it helps to have your back to the wall. Nothing gives you more energy than having your back to the wall and your income's at, uh, at stake. So, but I also found, and I started writing, that's how the book came about, is I started writing about emotional resilience. And I found digging deep into one's own depth of spirituality and your own character, I suppose, is now we're talking about character, is it was, it was a case of actually saying, I've, I can either lie down or I can come out fighting. And my greatest learnings, I think, uh, with a lot of help from Sonny, um, has been in lockdown. I have had the most incredible two years. I mean, business has grown by 20%. Um, I have experienced the most incredible transformations in my own life. And that's through a, an extremely difficult part. And I do love this country and I do believe we have incredible leadership, but we also have really shoddy um, examples of it. So, so I'm kind of filled with hope, but I'm, a, I'm also a realist. Mm. Okay. Thanks, Michael, for that. Um, Sunny. So what was really incredible for me was how everyone kind of went into shock um, and had to figure out how to deal with this new world of, you know, being in, isolated in their homes and things. And what was wonderful for us was working with our clients and how they gradually made the decision to learn from it, decided to um, become a little bit more agile. They didn't think of it like that. They just had to survive and we were helping them to survive and we were trying to survive ourselves. And a lot of people don't know that I was extremely ill, um, very, very extremely ill over the last two years. And one of the things that lockdown afforded me was a different kind of relationship with my clients because everybody got closer in their teams and everybody got closer with me and with, with Mike in terms of the struggles they were going through, we could help them to bring their difficulties to their teams and share. And that's what teams learn how to do often for the first time. And so for Mike and I, it was a journey in terms of we wanted to keep working and help our clients. For me, it was a godsend because I could keep working even though I was ill, but if I had not been able to be home, it wouldn't have been possible. So for me, my, as I grew in strength, we were able to help our clients to grow in strength and they were able to help their people. The leadership that was shown throughout the pandemic months and years has been extraordinary. And that's why people feel now they have a choice that they don't have to go back to work full time. They can work a hybrid work style. And I think that's really important. So I think in terms of hope and inspiration, the ability to manage change is your greatest gift. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Annie, for that. Tanya. I'm not going to escape this. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, somebody mentioned, uh, Gumi mentioned Ubuntu uh, in the chat. And as a freelance writer, I, I can hold up in my house and not see each other anybody you know for a long time if I don't want to I don't work with people I don't work in a big community um, but when COVID hit um, it became incredibly clear to me very quickly very harshly very hard um, how much I still interact with people regardless of whether I'm isolated physically from them or not and um, my sense of self and my sense of purpose in the world is very connected to other people. I became starkly aware of how important everyone is from the barista I see to the people I literally work with to um, just seeing people around. Um, it became clear to me that my being in the world was only worth as much as there were people around me to share that with in one way or another. And um, if I learned anything from that, and I don't know if it's a learning other people can take, but 
you know, my interest in relationships has always been there and continues to be there and was just hugely solidified by COVID that without other people, we are nothing. Without the many, the one is alone and singular. And so I think, um, yeah, I think just the absolute appreciation all the time that your time here, the betterment of yourself, of your business, of your clients, whatever it is, is always in purpose, is always in um, service to the other, whether you think it is or not, and whether you mean for that to be or not, that is just how it is. So. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, well, incidentally, by the way, my two, both Tanya and Sunny, they are married to my two favorite columnists for the <laughs> business day, Tom oh, yeah. and uh, Brian Rostrin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so both of them are these excellent, excellent uh, 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 contributors to the business day. Um, oh, tell them that, by the way. Um, I will let him know. Giving them the, a nice punt here. <laughs> uh, Paul, let's hear from you, my friend. Oh, thanks, uh, Balam. I'll be quick. I mean, yes, and to all those things that were said, uh, mine uh, was humble pie. I mean, I just thought that it was a huge humble pie that we were, we all had our faces smashed into as a species. Um, and I think, keep it coming. Um, I, I think it definitely... Um, sobered me up basically around, um, you know, the kindness of others and, the, uh, and, and how grateful I was to others who gave us opportunities to work and support them through, through the pandemic and, um, and to friends and family who, who provided comfort during that storm. Um, yeah, it was, it was just a, a wonderful lesson for, for me personally and I think for us as a species. So, yeah. Okay, guys, that brings us um, towards the close of, of this afternoon's launch. Um, firstly, thank you to all four of you for taking the time and effort and, um, and have this abundance mentality to share what your wisdom with, with everybody else there outside um, for bringing together two fantastic books that we are very proud to be associated with and uh, very proud to to be the publishers thereof. And from our side, we wish you all of the best, not only in, in, in the, the selling of the books, but also in your, your businesses and your endeavors, Tanya, there as well on your side. Um, I want to thank, um, apart from the authors that I thank always, um, uh, Sia Hubert. Sia, can you put the, your TV camera on, please? There she is. Sia is, our, is running our publishing site. So she's the midwife of getting the, giving birth to the books. So Sia, from, from all of us, thank you very much. You're doing a sterling job there. We really appreciate that. All right. And then to uh, uh, Tina, who organized the launch. Thanks a lot for the hard work in, in coaching everybody in and to, um, for, for putting the, the event together this evening. We really appreciate that. Okay, guys, that brings us to the end. We thank you all for your... Um, for your contribution um, and have a great evening and to everybody who, who attended um, you know i always said when we had the live the live uh, um, live in-person launches i said the only way you can get out of the the building the, your security card is your a copy of your book that you've a uh, copy of the book that you bought now i can't i can't um, bamboozle you here tonight but nevertheless we appreciate your support we, uh, thank you for that All right. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.